Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a new series of videos today on the topic of traditional logic. Traditional logic is something which I think you really have to know about to understand the history of Western philosophy, but the difficulty is that even though you need to know about it for, say, uh, understanding Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, for after all, the main point of that book is to understand how synthetic a priori judgments are possible, specifically in the sense that Kant would have understood that in, say, the 18th century before the rise of modern logic, back when they were still basically um, using the same framework that Aristotle had developed with some modifications. Well, you need to know about all that stuff to really understand the history of Western philosophy, but the difficulty is that um, it's not really taught formally anymore the same way that um, more modern forms of logic are. From my experience, if you study logic on a college campus, you're probably going to be studying a more modern form, something influenced by someone like Frege and Russell, etc., which certainly is a valid field of study, but I think that you have to supplement that with a serious study of traditional logic, which is exactly what we're going to do here on YouTube. And we have to go back into the archive to find an old textbook like uh, Principles of Logic by George Joyce, um, a textbook written by someone who is explicitly trying to preserve the traditional um, tradition, if you will, <laughs> of logic um, as somebody who is a proponent of scholastic philosophy, even into, you know, like the early 20th Century. So this textbook is a really good resource, I think, for us to uh, understand something which is once again essential for doing Western philosophy, but was which something which is also just one of the best things that you can study in your life. For if you understand what quote unquote good and clear thinking looks like in and of itself, you can understand what it looks like in any other field. And so as we get into the textbook itself, we find that in the first chapter. He opens by defining logic as, quote-unquote, the science which directs the operations of the mind in the attainment of truth. But what exactly does truth mean from a purely logical standpoint? Well, contrary to how the term might be used in ordinary speech, in logic, strictly speaking, you only have truth or falsity if you have a complete judgment. This is because a judgment within traditional logic is a relation of two concepts in which a predicate is either asserted or it is denied of a subject. To put it very simply, the judgment will be true if the subject really does contain the predicate which it is asserted to have, or it will also be true if the subject really does not contain the predicate which it is denied to have. We bear in mind that in traditional logic, um, judgments might have one of two, basically, qualities. They might either be affirmative or they might also be negative, and they will be true or false on different grounds depending on the truth uh, conditions of each of those. So judgments are what can be true or false within traditional logic, but it is admitted that judgments are not the simplest kinds of thoughts which we can think. A simpler kind of thought than a complete judgment is a, a mere apprehension, as it would be called in traditional logic. If I simply apprehend, my mind forms a concept of something without affirming or denying anything with regard to it. If you really think about it, the list of words in a dictionary are mere apprehensions of this sort. For on their own, the words in the dictionary are neither true nor false. If I simply say a noun like dog or a verb like to run, these freestanding concepts, as they are called, have no truth value because I have not yet combined a subject with a predicate in a judgment with a quality as either being affirmative or negative. I don't have any truth conditions. In other words, if all I do is think about a concept in and of itself. Another way to say this in traditional logic is that in predication, I say something about something. And it's precisely that relation of the two concepts which allows me perhaps to represent in Kellogg's sentence diagramming form that if I just have dog or I just have run, I haven't filled out both sides of the diagram. It's only if I complete both of them, the dog runs, for example, 
that I have something which can be true or false. In traditional logic, though, a judgment is not the most complicated or perhaps impressive thing which the mind is able to do in thinking. For more complicated than simply forming a judgment that relates one concept to another in a subject-predicate relation, which can be true or false, um, is the ability for the mind to perform an inference. This is um, that whereby the mind proceeds from two given judgments to a third judgment, which is distinct from those first two, but is still somehow implicitly contained in them. This act of inferring a third judgment from two others is called reasoning, in the proper sense of the term. This is something we know through the classic example of a syllogism, in which we have the premises, all men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, and then from those, we arrive at the conclusion, Socrates is mortal. As we move on to the second chapter titled The Concept, The Name, and The Term, the textbook cautions us that the mind's ability to logically think a judgment which can be true or false is much more than the mundane idea of having a mental representation of the world. For if all I have is a representation in the sense of, say, a picture of the world, that's not enough to give me logical thinking or judging. The difference is that if all I have is, say, a mental image of a round sun, I'm not really thinking logically because the corresponding judgment, the sun is round, actually separates the sun from its roundness, even though the two are unified in reality. If all I have is the picture that maintains the unity of the round sun, I'm not really thinking logically, because logical thinking only begins with the kind of abstraction which can separate the subject from the predicate, even though, once again, in reality, those two are unified. We could say in quasi-Kantian terms that the imagination might help you form a mental image, but only the higher faculty of the understanding can perhaps separate the subject from its attributes in order to think of those as distinct concepts. The sun as one concept and its roundness as Another. Another difference is that understanding thinks concepts not only as being separated um, from one another, even if they are together in reality, it also thinks those concepts as having an explicitly universal character. For example, if I talk about roundness in abstraction, even as separated from things that are round, I realize that roundness applies to far more than the thing which I have just attributed to. There are many circular objects beyond the sun, for example, and it's precisely when I separate roundness from round things through the kind of abstraction which logic presupposes and always makes use of that I can recognize that concepts pretty much by default deal with things which are universal rather than singular. Now, one advantage of shifting the emphasis from things in the mundane sense of the term to concepts in their universality and abstraction is that it allows us to discover certain rules with regard to the way that concepts will relate to each other. Even in universal or abstract terms, certain concepts simply cannot be combined with one another. By this, I don't mean that the composite of the two concepts would be unimaginable in the sense that I could not form a mental picture of what it would look like even if it did exist. No, the deeper point is that concepts which cannot be combined, which we call repugnant concepts in traditional logic, are inconceivable rather than just unimaginable. For example, if I talk about a thinking stone, that might be imaginable in the sense that I could form some sort of picture in my mind of what a thinking stone would look like if it did exist. But even if it is imaginable, it's inconceivable in the sense that I can't actually understand what a thinking stone would be because the concept of an inanimate thing actively excludes the meaning of a concept of a thing with a mind, and vice versa. So if I say there is an inanimate thing 
which has a mind, I've already tried to combine two repugnant concepts which actively exclude each other even before I try to imagine what such a thing would look like even if it could exist. Now, another thing that I find as I try to consider concepts in their abstraction and universality is that there are different kinds of concepts, if you will. Within traditional logic, there are adequate, clear, and obscure concepts in the following sense. A concept is adequate if it distinctly represents all of the notes of an individual of that type. This is impossible for natural objects because natural objects simply contain too many details to satisfy the criteria of being adequate. But mathematical objects, like say Euclid's definition of a circle, actually can qualify as adequate concepts in this sense. That is to say, a Euclidean circle defined as that for which every point is equidistant from the center, or a Euclidean square as that four-sided object for which each of the four sides is equal in length to the others. These are adequate concepts because, once again, I can distinctly represent all the notes of an individual of that type, but this generally applies just to purely abstract entities like geometrical shapes, etc. On the other hand, a concept is clear if it contains admittedly not all the notes, but enough of them to distinguish an individual of one type from an individual of another type. This is really how our understanding of natural objects works. We have enough of the criteria to distinguish one species of animal from another, even if we don't have all of them. So our um, understanding of species of animals, like the difference between you know one species of um, a chimpanzee and one species of a gorilla, we have um, enough of the criteria to understand the difference between those two as clear concepts, though admittedly not as adequate ones. Finally, a concept is understood to be obscure if it fails at both of these. And so we now move on to consider what the term term itself means within traditional logic as well as what the term name means. In traditional logic, a name is just a group of words which signify a concept, but in addition to that also signify the object of that concept. Now, the way that it can do both of those at the same time is that the name immediately names the universal concept, but it only immediately names the object of that concept. In other words, the name really stands for the universal, and the individuals are known through instantiating that universal, but in a way that really places the emphasis on the abstract or separated universal as the thing which is understood by the mind. For example, if I say that Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Beethoven are all men, what I really mean is that the same universal concept of man is known in all of those different instances. Now, another important distinction within traditional logic is between categorimatic and syncategorimatic words. Now, that might sound like a mouthful, but etymologically in Greek, categorimatic um, just means to predicate, while syn means together with. So the difference between these two types of words is that the former, that is to say the categorimatic ones, can be used as independent terms, while the latter cannot. You can only use syn categorimatic words in combination with some other term. Categorimatic words include what we might consider in traditional grammar to be nouns, pronouns, adjectives, and participles, with the nouns and pronouns typically functioning as the subject and with the adjective and participle typically functioning as predicate. For example, if I say I, the king of France, am bald and singing in the shower. This admittedly silly example shows you how these four different types I just named might be sorted into their respective positions in the diagram. On the other hand, syncategorimatic words include things like conjunctions. In logic, you're connecting words like and, or, if, then, etc. are syncategorimatic words. Um, this textbook also includes interjections 
in that category. Now, a word of caution here. We can treat syncategorimatic words as though they were categorimatic words, but only if we use them in a very different sense than they would usually have. For example, if I say and is a coordinating conjunction, in a certain sense, I'm using the word and as the subject of predication and treating it as some sort of noun, but I'm not really talking about the and, which is a syncategorimatic conjunction. Instead, I'm referring to the word and as a certain sound pattern within natural language, and I'm just interrogating that sound pattern within language with regard to its properties as a word in the mundane sense of the term. In that sense, I'm treating a syncategorimatic word as though it were a categorimatic word, but in the process, I'm not actually violating that distinction, which will hold good regardless. Finally, a term composed of both of these types is called a many-worded term, while a term that is composed of only one of them is called a single-worded term. The only kind of single-worded term that is possible is, of course, a categorimatic one, such as a noun denoting a subject, etc. This is because a syncategorimatic word like and or if once again cannot occur on its own. Now, another important subdivision within traditional logic is um, among singular, general, and collective terms. A term is singular if it refers to only one individual. In ordinary language, this would be something like a proper name, like um, Sara Ali Khan, only one actress with that name, I believe. A singular term, though, does not have to be a literal proper name, for one could use general terms in such a way as to restrict the meaning they have down to only one individual individual. For example, if I say the present day king of Saudi Arabia, I'm actually using a singular term despite the fact that that's not a proper name. I have instead restricted the meaning of a combination of more general terms such that they now refer to only one person. Notice how the adverbial information about time and place is often what I emphasize to narrow meaning down in just this way. If I say that it's not just any king of Saudi Arabia, for there were various ones over time, but just the present day king of that nation, I have narrowed the meaning down to a singular term without having to use a proper name. If I say similarly that I'm not talking about all cups of coffee, it over the span of history and across the span of the earth. No, I'm only talking about the one cup of coffee, which is here on the table where I'm sitting. I have also narrowed down the meaning of that term to become singular. In contrast, a general term is one which can be used in the same sense to refer to many things. More specifically, though, we could say that a general or universal term can be used distributively to apply a universal meaning in the same way to each of the members in a list of many. It is important to note that from the standpoint of logic, it is not necessary that such a list of members instantiating that universal property should literally exist, for the term can have a universal applicability even if such a term is merely capable of being distributively applied to many different instances. Now that might sound like a mouthful, but let's consider the following example. Even if there were only one speaker of the Sumerian language still alive on planet Earth, the term speaker of Sumerian would still be a universal term because it would still have the potential to be distributively applied to anyone fitting that criteria. So you can imagine Back in, say, 100 BC or something like that, the last inscription of Sumerian that we have, um, whoever that person was who was the last speaker, um, they were still um, instantiating a term which would be general despite the fact that there's only one person on the earth who actually fits its criteria. Even, I would say, in the centuries between that person's death and the time in the 19th century when Sumerian was rediscovered by archaeologists, in all of those centuries when quite literally nobody actually spoke Sumerian on the face of the earth, the term speaker of Sumerian was still a general term because it was enough for that term to be potentially distributively applied to many members of a series, even if nobody actually could have that term applied to them 
at that time. Now, another very important thing to consider in traditional logic is the difference between intention and extension. Intention, spelled with an S rather than a T before ION, um, refers to the characteristics included in a common concept insofar as that concept could be applied to many individuals. Extension, on the other hand, refers to the set of individuals which do indeed fall under that concept. Now, it sh should be fairly clear that in traditional uh, logic, these two are inversely related to one another. For the more specific an intention is, the fewer items can fall under it within its extension. On the other hand, the less well-defined a concept is, the more members will fall under it, precisely because its extension will grow as its intention shrinks and vice versa. Intention is also called connotation, while extension is also called denotation. Now, another important distinction within traditional logic is the difference between having a general term distributively applied to each member within a set versus having a collective term applied to the group as a whole. This is a very subtle distinction, which I think will only really fully make sense from the standpoint of logic rather than, say, grammar or the ordinary study of language, but the reason for this can be clarified through the example of the Himalayas. When I talk about the Himalayas, I might seem to be applying a universal term distributively to each mountain within that range, but that's actually not what I'm doing. From a logical standpoint, the term Himalayas refers to the whole set of those mountains as a collective group. And the reason for that is that the term Himalaya, quote unquote, does not actually name any universal property which each of the mountains would instantiate in its own way. Insofar as there are different members within the set that have something in common, we just call these similar terms because some sort of metaphorical family resemblance is held in common by each of those um, members, by all of them, to separate them from things outside of that particular group. But it's not actually a universal attribute which they are all instantiating individually. For example, if we consider the collective term the Dravidian languages, we can admit that there's some family resemblance which each of the Dravidian languages has to each other. They have similar grammar, they have similar vocabulary, they have similar pronunciation, but there is no such universal property as Dravidian language Nis, which they all instantiate on their own. In contrast, the set of red objects don't just have a family resemblance to each other in that way. Each red object really does instantiate the same universal property of redness, and it does so through having that be distributively applied to each one of them individually. And so we now move on to discussion of the difference uh, between abstract and concrete terms. An abstract term is the name of an attribute as separated from its subject. For example, I could talk about spiciness in general, while a concrete term is the name of an attribute as joined to its subject. For example, I could talk about spicy chicken curry. We can say that the former is merely an adjective, while the latter is a compound of an adjective and the noun which it modifies. But a more Aristotelian way to put this would be to say that abstract terms treat the accident of some substance as though that accident were a substance in its own right. When we speak of spiciness as some sort of object, we are actually talking about the higher order accidental of some other substance as though it were a substance itself. From an Aristotelian standpoint, we can take this even further. The mind can apply this sort of abstraction and separation to substantialize not just one of the higher order accidentals of a substance like a human person, but rather to substantialize abstract and separate the nature of that substance itself. When we talk about humanity as something distinct from all of the instances of human persons, we're really doing something like that. We substantialize human nature into something which seems to be a real substantive 
even though it really is just an abstraction which the mind had separated from those real things like human persons. So we now move on to the difference between connotative and non-connotative terms. Connotative terms denote a subject as implying an attribute, whereas a non-connotative term denotes only a subject or only an attribute. Typically, proper names are cited as classic examples of non-connotative terms because a proper name normally wouldn't tell you anything about the intention, spelled with an S, um, qua the meaning of some universal concept. However, this line between the two is not always so easy to draw. Not all proper names are purely um, going to function that way. For if you consider the example of the name John Miller, that is a proper name, despite the fact that Miller typically named a profession or a skill which um, that man and his family as a whole had traditionally practiced. Miller referred in the olden days to the guy who was the Miller in the village. So in that sense, the name John Miller really does have some intentional connotation rather than denote an individual in a purely arbitrary manner which can't really be understood in universal conceptual grounds. On the other hand, some proper names have lost their status as true proper names through simply becoming words with a connotation loaded with so much intentional meaning that that term can be applied to many people with a certain characteristic. The classic example of this is Don Quixote. In the book, Don Quixote was just a proper name without any connotation, but over time it came to be more like a universal term to refer to anyone who's out of touch with reality or living in their own mind and delusions. In that case, once again, we use the name Don Quixote as a universal word with an intentional meaning rather than use it as a proper name that refers to only one subject on purely arbitrary grounds. And so we now move on to talk about positive and negative terms. A positive term signifies the presence of some attribute, while a negative term signifies the absence thereof. Whereas living is a positive term because it um, signifies the presence of life, lifeless is a negative term because it signifies the absence of life. Privative terms are negative in the specific sense of referring to privations in which something is absent, but not just absent, but something is absent which was expected to be present. For example, some animal species are inherently speechless because they don't have the part of, say, the brain that we have which is necessary for language. But only human individuals can be called mute as opposed to speechless, because human beings, in accord with their human nature, are expected to be able to speak. The traditional definition of uh, man as the animal with logos leads the absence of speech in humans to be a privation in the proper sense of the term, whereas the speechlessness of, say, a jellyfish isn't really a privation because we didn't expect them to have that ability in accord with their nature. In addition, you may recall from reading, say, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, that there are also infinite or indeterminate terms like immortal. If I say something that is immortal, I'm not just saying that it's not mortal as an ordinary negative term. Um, rather, I am uh, talking about something which should be called infinite or indeterminate because I'm trying to form a set which isn't really a proper set. Whereas the class of mortal things does have clear limits because that's a positive term with a clear meaning. If I say something is immortal, I'm actually trying to form an improper set. And the reason for this from a traditional uh, logic standpoint is that the term non-human, because it does not have any positive signification, can apply just as much to real things like dogs. Those are inhuman, just as much as it can apply to fictitious or unreal things like unicorns. Unicorns are also non-human. And so we now move on to the distinction between absolute and relative terms. An absolute term is a name which makes no reference to anything else with regard to its meaning, whereas a relative term kind of has to be understood along with its correlative 
um, for you to know what it means. So to use a very simple example, um, I can't use parent as an absolute term because if I don't know what a child is, I don't know what a parent is either. Traditionally, husband and wife were also correlatives uh, such as you couldn't understand what one was without the other. Um, right and left are examples of this. I don't know what the right side is unless I know what the left side is. Uh, because once again, each of these are correlatives of the other. Terms are absolute specifically if they lack any such correlative. It bears mentioning, though, that relative terms don't only apply to concrete terms or real things like, say, husbands and wives, parents, children, etc. They can also apply to abstract terms. For example, I can only really know what domination is if I know what subjection is because these are correlatives of each other. Alright, so we now move on to terms of first and second intention spelled with a T rather than S. Important distinction. The textbook tells us um, that a term of first intention is one which is applicable to the object as it exists in the real order. A term of second intention is one which is applicable to the object only as it exists in the conceptual order. And this will make sense if we consider a very basic example. Um, if I talk about a pine tree that is part of a forest, I'm referring to pine tree here as a first intention term because I'm situating it in the real order of physical objects. In contrast, if I say that this pine tree is an object of my mind's thinking, or even further, if I say that pine tree, quote unquote, is a universal concept, or let's say a compound noun, something like that, these are examples of second intention because these references to pine tree treat it as something which exists only in the conceptual order. Why, though, does traditional logic use the term intention, once again spelled with a T rather than S here? Well, the reason is that intention is the medieval term for an act of the mind. This is why it was later adopted in Husserlian phenomenology to refer to human consciousness's ability to be conscious of objects beyond itself. So these are really the first and second types of acts of the mind. That is to say, you can think the object as it is in the real order, or you can think the object as it is merely in the conceptual order. So we now move on to the difference among univocal, equivocal, and analogous terms. A univocal term is always used with the same intention spelled with an S. Equivocal terms are actually two different terms that sound the same from the standpoint of ordinary speech, uh, but have different intentions, once again spelled with an S, and are therefore not really of any logical importance. The only reason we care about them in logic is to avoid the uh, logical fallacy of equivocation, which is precisely using two different terms as though they were the same one and then arriving at a, um, an unsound conclusion as a result of that. Analogous terms express two meanings which are partially but not wholly the same. For example, if I call a person healthy, and then I call a certain kind of food like, say, millet porridge healthy, um, these are partly but not fully the same sort of meaning. For a person can be called healthy if that person is of a sound condition with regard to their mind and body, whereas a food can be called healthy if it produces health in the person who eats it. We now move on to discuss the opposition of terms. Contradictory opposition is simply the opposition between a term and its direct negation. For example, I oppose blue and not blue. Impressively, those two terms will cover all possible things. For everything, no matter what it might be, is either blue or it is not blue. There are no other options. On the other hand, contrary opposition is an opposition between two things which are furthest removed from one another while still belonging to the same genus. Black and white, for example, are contraries because to be black isn't just to be not white. It's more specifically to be the color which is the most different from white among all the other colors within a smooth continuum, if you will. It is precisely because they both belong to the same genus that they can be the most meaningfully different from one another. For if I simply oppose that which is black to that which is not black, that's far less meaningful. Another example of contraries can be found in opposing the adjective nice to the adjective mean. Both of these are ways for humans to behave, but they are opposed to each other um, 
in being two different ends of the same continuum. In contrast, the contradiction found in opposing what is blue to what is simply not blue is a much more abrupt transition, because those two don't really have anything in common, and for that reason is a somewhat less meaningful distinction. For this reason, traditional logicians have um, tended to call contradictoriness formal contradiction or formal opposition, and they have tended to call contrary opposition material opposition, because in the latter case, we can't actually know how two things differ from one another as two different ends of a smooth continuum unless we really know what they are as materially realized things. In the former case, though, formal criteria alone are enough. You can imagine some strange hypothetical scenario in which there was a robot from outer space who didn't really understand what the difference between nice and mean behavior were because it wasn't human. Uh, it could not understand that sort of material difference. But it could understand the purely formal difference between something which is an even number and something which is not an even number. Finally, we end the discussion of today's chapters by considering the suppositio of the term. These are the various ways that the same term can be used differently. We'll start by considering the difference between collective and distributive use of terms. It is possible to predicate things of plural subjects, but there's a difference between um, predicating X of all members of a group as individuals versus doing so collectively. We've already encountered this through the difference between a distributive predication, like all red things instantiate the universal red as individuals, versus um, a collective predication, such as talking about um, the Himalayas as a group without using the term Himalaya as the name of any universal which they all instantiate. Another important distinction is between the real and logical use of a given term. Consider the following examples. If I say the author of Don Quixote is Miguel Cervantes or was Miguel Cervantes because he's dead, um, then I'm using the term author of Don Quixote to refer to a person in the real order of things, physical objects, etc. But if I say the author of Don Quixote, within quotes, is the subject of the previous sentence, then I'm using the term to refer to a term, in which case I am treating it as something situated in the logical order of subjects, predicates, etc. Finally, the suppositio materialis means that a word is taken to signify a spoken sound or written symbol as such. For example, if I say to run is an infinitive form of a verb, or if I say that run is a word composed of three letters, I'm not really talking about run except as a suppositio materialis or as a spoken sound or written symbol as such. So this will conclude our discussion of the first two chapters. We will resume next week talking about propositions and judgments.